everyone, welcome to the lecture on patterns of inheritance. Our objectives for this lecture are to understand heredity. You should be able to define terms common to basic genetics. You should be able to explain single, monohybrid, and double factor or dihybrid cases of inheritance. I explain common cases of inheritance beyond Mendelian genetics and describe epigenetic effects on gene expression. So first, let's talk about Gregor Mendel. Mendel was an Austrian monk, and he brought experimental and quantitative approach to genetics. He bred pea plants to study patterns of inheritance. Why peas, do you wonder? Well, he was able to control the mating, so he could either let them self-pollinate or cross-pollinate. Um, and he controlled that the cross-pollination, he used a paintbrush to carry pollen from one plant to another. And there were many varieties of pea plants available to him to work with. They have a short generation time, so he was able to study many generations. All right, so consider this experiment which Mendel conducted. We have a parental generation, the pea generation of true breeding plants. So every time you breed purple to purple flowers, all the, all the flowers that grow from the seeds, all the offspring also have purple flowers. And for the white flowered parents, they're also true breeding. White crossed with white always produces white flowered pea plants. And we call, if we were to cross these two true breeding parents, a purple flower with a white flower, we'd end up with our F1 hybrids. And F1 means the first filial generations. All it is is it's the first generation of a cross. So all plants in this F1 generation had purple flowers. In the F2 generation, we see out of about, if we round up, to a thousand flowers almost three quarters of them were purple and one quarter was white flowered which is interesting so we breed two hybrids together we start to see these white flowers again and f2 is the second filial generation or it's the cross of the cross good Okay, so you should be familiar with these terms. There were actually seven characteristics in pea plants that Mendel studied. Flower color, seed color, seed shape, pod shape, pod color, flower position, and the stem length. Now, these traits were all either dominant or recessive. So you see this column here, these are all the dominant traits. And this column here, these are all the recessive traits. What does it mean to be dominant? Well, let's back up a sec. So alternative versions of genes are called alleles. Oops. And they cause variation in inherited characters among offspring. So in humans, we get one chromosome from mom, which has an allele. We have a second chromosome from dad, which would also carry an allele for whatever gene we're interested in. So each of us has two alleles for every gene. If the two alleles are different, the dominant allele will be the one that's expressed. That's what we can see. The recessive allele will have no noticeable effect on the offspring's appearance. It'll be hidden. And the law of segregation, going back to meiosis, tells us that the two alleles for each character separate during gamete formation, during meiosis. So if we're looking on a pair of homologous chromosomes here, one from dad, one from mom, if this is the gene for flower color. On the chromosome from dad, there's an allele for purple flowers. On the chromosome from mom, there's an allele for white flowers. 
Now, what we actually see is purple flowers, and that's because this purple flower gene is dominant over the white one. That's the gene that gets expressed. It gets translate, translated and transcribed into the actual enzyme or the protein that makes the purple color. Does that make sense? So the dominant allele determines what phenotype we see, what the physical characteristic is. All right, so if we cross true breeding purple flowers, they have only the dominant purple allele, right? They're homozygous, they have two of the same allele for the dominant. So this is homozygous dominant. The white flowered true breeding parents are homozygous recessive. They have two copies of the recessive allele. And when we cross them, this parent can only give a, a dominant P allele, right? Whereas this parent can only give a lowercase p allele. And we're talking about meiosis here, basically, right? When those two alleles combine to form an F1 offspring, all the offspring, 100%, will be heterozygotes. Hetero means difference. So they have two different alleles for that flower color gene. For the next generation, there's going to be some variation because half of the sperm from this flower, this heterozygote, will have an uppercase P and half of the gametes are equally likely to have a lowercase P. And that's how we fill in this punnet square. Go ahead and make one in your notes. Draw one big square, divide it into four smaller squares. So the F1 parent plant can give a big P or a little p to its offspring. And remember to get the F2, we have to cross two F1 flowers together. So a second P, uh, a second heterozygous, heterozygous individual down here. So these would be the eggs from a female flower would have a dominant P and a lowercase p allele that they could give. And then to figure out what the possible offspring genotypes are, you just go down the list. So this dominant P allele goes into each of these boxes, gets a dominant P. This recessive P goes in here and gives a recessive P to each. And then we do the same thing left to right. So this dominant P goes in here and in this box. And this recessive P goes to here and to there. And now we can see the different combinations of genotypes. So 25% or one out of four will have homozygous dominant genotype. Two out of four offspring or 20 or 50%, sorry, would have a heterozygous genotype. And where's my cursor? There we go. One out of four would have homozygous recessive genotype. And if we were to look at their phenotypes, we see that three out of four possibilities have that dominant allele and will look purple. Only one out of four offspring has the two copies of the recessive allele and will actually look white. So that's how we get this three to one down here. All right, so we know that the uppercase designates the dominant allele, lowercase is the recessive. And this is a convention that we keep almost universally. If you see an uppercase allele, that means it's dominant, and a lowercase means it's recessive, if they're the same letter. All right, so here we're comparing phenotypes, the physical appearance, with the genotype, the genetic combination of alleles. You should also be familiar with the terms homozygous and heterozygous. Homozygous have two of the same alleles, so it could be homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. And if they have one of each, they are heterozygous. The 
the phenotype are the expressed physical traits, so purple flowers and white flowers. Oops, sorry. You also need to know these terms, phenotype and genotype. So let's look at some Punnett squares and how they represent gamete formation and fertilization. So a Punnett square uses the genotypes of the parents to reveal which alleles the offspring may inherit. So in an F1 generation, all the individuals are heterozygous, right? So in this in instance, we're looking at the gene for seed color in the pea plants. Yellow is dominant over green, right? So that's why the uppercase letter is a Y for yellow. So if we have a female parent on top who has a dominant and a recessive allele, she can give either one to her offspring, right? So these are the possible female gametes with a yellow allele or a recessive green allele. And the male parent has the same to offer to his offspring, a dominant yellow or a recessive green. Excuse me. All right, so when we carry these down, so the top ones we write down in the boxes below them, these we write left to right, so we add a big Y and a big Y, little y, little y. We see the genotypic ratio here is there's one homozygous dominant possibility, two heterozygous possibilities, and one homozygous recessive possibility. And the phenotypic ratio that we'll see then is three out of four offspring will have yellow seeds and one out of four will have green seeds. All right, so in this example, well, we've done that. This is a monohybrid cross since both parents are hybrids or heterozygous. When germ cells divide by meiosis, the gametes receive one allele per gene. For seed color gene, there is an equal chance of receiving either a dominant Y or a recessive Y. And a gamete from the female parent and a gamete from the male parent then unite at fertilization. In this monohybrid cross, both gametes could happen to carry dominant alleles. So you could end up with big Y, big Y. It could also happen to carry one dominant and one recessive allele. And that would be a heterozygous offspring. And in this monohybrid cross, both gametes could happen to carry recessive alleles, little y, little y. And that would result in this green homozygous recessive individual here. This Punnett square is a prediction showing the relative proportion of the offspring's phenotypes and genotypes. So yellow is dominant. So why are some seeds green when a yellow seeded plant is crossed with a green seeded plant? Well, it depends on the genotype of the parents, right? So if we have a homozygous dominant yellow parent and we cross it with a homozygous recessive, 100% of the offspring will be heterozygotes, right? Because the green parent can only give a little y allele to its offspring. And the yellow parent here can only give a big Y. So all the offspring will be big Y, little y, and appear yellow. In this cross where we breed a homozygous recessive green pea plant, green seeded plant to a heterozygous yellow seeded plant, we see something very different. 
right? Now, this parent can still only give little y alleles to its offspring, but this one will give half of its offspring that dominant allele. So half of the offspring will be yellow seeded. And the other half of the offspring will get this recessive allele and have green seeds. So that's why this one is 50-50, yellow and green. All right, a test cross can reveal parental genotypes. So if a cross between a yellow seeded pea plant and a green seeded pea plant, pea plant yields all yellow seeds, then the yellow seeded parent must be homozygous dominant. If a cross between a yellow seeded pea plant and a green seeded pea plant, pea plant yields some green seeds, then the yellow seeded parent must be heterozygous. Because the only way we end up with these green seeded ones is if they get a lowercase y from the yellow parent. All right, so after doing his experiments, Mendel was able to deduce that each the two alleles of each gene segregate or they move apart from each other during gamete formation. Now, Mendel didn't know about genes. He didn't even know about chromosomes. But he knew that something had to be separating independently from each other as offspring were formed. So now we know that means that these replicated chromosomes homologous chromosomes in meiosis, they segregate into all the alleles into gametes. And the same thing happens for both parents. So then you pick one randomly from this pot, one randomly from this pot, and they combine to make up the genotype of an offspring individual. So here we have fertilization, gametes combine at random, and in meiosis, the two alleles for the seed color gene are packaged into separate gametes. Which gamete is used in fertilization is random. All right, Mendel's work can be applied to many traits, not just pea plants. Punnett squares can be used to track the inheritance of genetic disorders like cystic fibrosis. So here we have an example where we have a mother who's healthy but carries the cystic fibrosis allele. A healthy carrier is a heterozygote, right? So she can give her babies either a healthy non-carrier dominant allele or a recessive cystic fibrosis allele. The father is also a healthy carrier, a heterozygote, so he can give his kids either a normal, healthy, non-carrier allele or an affected, where's my cursor, or a non-affected, an affected cystic fibrosis allele. And we can do the same thing here. 25% of the kids will be healthy non-carriers. Two-fourths or 50% of the kids will be healthy carriers like their parents. But two out of four kids from this breeding would be affected and have cystic fibrosis. So if cystic fibrosis or any other genetic disorders run in your family, understanding Punnett squares and meeting with a genetic counselor could be really beneficial as you make decisions about having biological children of your own. It's important that you understand the risks and the probabilities associated with those things. All right, so what I'd like you to do is make a Punnett square on your notes and practice with this example. See if you can do a heterozygous cross, so two heterozygote parents on the outside of your Punnett square box and see if you can figure out how to do a Punnett square all on your own. Fill it in and then tell me what's the ratio of the different genotypes and the ratio of the different phenotypes. Hmm. 
Oh. We just did this one together. Let's move on. All right. Let's set up another Punnett square here for this one. So cystic fibrosis is a lung disease caused by a recessive allele F. Little f. If a healthy carrier has an affected and an affected individual, so someone with cystic fibrosis, have a child, what's the chance that the child would also be affected by cystic fibrosis? Build your Punnett square and see if you can use the Punnett square to confirm that 50% of the offspring would be homozygous recessive and have the phenotype of cystic fibrosis. All right, we talked about test crosses earlier when we were talking about seed color. Um, a test cross is used to determine if the dominant trait is unknown. So if we don't know if the parent with the dominant phenotype is homozygous or heterozygous, we could do a test cross by breeding that individual to a recessive homozygote. If we only see dominant alleles or dominant phenotypes in the offspring, then we know that this parent up here must be homozygous dominant. If we see 50-50 dominant phenotype and recessive phenotype, then we know that this individual must have been a heterozygote. All right, so this law of independent assortment, this tells us that each pair of alleles segregates or separates independently during gamete formation, which means they're all equally likely to end up in the offspring. Okay. It also means that color is separate from shape. So that like if, if a pea plant has yellow seeds, that has no impact on what shape the seed will have, whether it's round or wrinkled. So the traits are all independent or the genes are independent. And this is an example of a Punnett square that's a dihybrid cross. We're looking at two traits at once. I think I have a better slide coming up. Okay. So a monohybrid cross is when we're only interested in one character, one gene at a time, maybe flower color. For a dihybrid cross, this is when we want to study two characteristics at once like flower color and seed shape. So let's do a dihybrid cross together. Draw your Punnett square. You might need to make it bigger than your last one that you made. And you're going to want to divide each side into fourths. So we should end up with four by four grid or 16 squares total here. And we're going to fill it in the same way, but we need to think of for each of the parents. So if this parent up here, the female parent, is heterozygous for seed shape, round or wrinkled, and it's also heterozygous for color, right, yellow or green, then there's four different possible outcomes that could be made. It could be big R, big Y. So that would be one possible gamete. It could be big R, little y, the next possible gamete. It could be little r, big y, here, or little r, little y, this one. So you're just doing all the possible outcomes for how these different alleles might separate out. And you do the same thing down here for the male parent. All the different possible gametes. So big R, big Y, big R, little y, little r, big y, and little r, little y. And then we carry those across left to right for the male's gametes 
and the females we carry down and we end up with these diploid genotypes so there should be four alleles for every individual right all the possible offspring two alleles for seed shape two alleles for seed color All right, so the two genes on different chromosomes can be shown in one large Punnett square. The alleles for each gene are shown in the parent, the gametes, and the offspring. Meiosis explains the law of independent assortment. So chromosomes carrying alleles are packaged into gametes independently of each other as the spindle fibers pull them into opposite sides of the cell, right? What I'd like you to do here is do an example dihybrid cross all by yourself. So make your big Punnett square, divide it into 16 boxes. You have a heterozygous parent on top and a heterozygous parent on the side. And then fill it in, figure out the ratio of genotypes and phenotypes. All right. Laws of probability govern Mendelian inheritance. So the multiplication rule is the probability that two or more independent events will occur together in a specific combination. This is where you multiply the probabilities of each event, like the probability that you end up with a pea plant that has round green seeds. Right? They're independent events, and we want to know what's the chance that they both happen. And you multiply your probabilities here. So there's some examples here. I'm looking at example two and chuckling to myself. I have three boys right now. I'm due to have number four any day now. So the chance that I would end up with five boys in a row is one out of 32. That doesn't mean that there's 31 out of 32 chance that if I had a sixth child that it would be female though, right? Because each of these events are independent. So, I don't know. Something fun to think about. Probabilities are interesting. All right, example number three. If we were to cross this times this, the probability of an offspring with this genotype would be So we'd have to figure out what's the probability of getting a dominant allele for A and a recessive allele for A times, so multiply those and then so on all the way through. These probabilities are interesting. I won't ask you questions with this level of detail on our exam, but I want you to know that this is how you go about calculating those things. I will ask you for the ratios of genotypes and phenotypes. All right, the addition rule. So if you're wondering about the probability that two or more mutually exclusive events will occur, then you add together the individual probabilities. For example, what are the chances of throwing a die that will land on a four or a five? Well, that's one out of six plus one out of six. All right, so we can think of segregation of alleles and fertilization as chance events. So it doesn't mean that exactly 50% each time, but it should be on average. 50% of the sperm from this individual would get a big R and 50% would get a little r. And for this female, about 50% of her eggs should be the dominant R and 50% should be the recessive R. Extending Mendelian genetics. So the relationship between genotype and phenotype is in reality rarely as simple as Mendel's pea plants. 
where it's either dominant or recessive. Most genotypes and phenotypes have a more complicated relationship than that. So in, in, in complete dominance, heterozygote and homozygote for the dominant allele are indistinguishable. You cannot tell them apart just by looking. There, so the homozygous dominant for yellow seeds and the heterozygous individual for yellow seeds look the same. You can't tell them apart just by looking. Incomplete dominance is when those first generation hybrids have an appearance that is in between that of the two parents. So this would be something where like if you crossed a plant with red flowers with a plant with white flowers and all the heterozygotes were pink. That would be an example of incomplete dominance. You will need to know complete dominance and incomplete dominance. As well as co-dominance. So this is a phenotype where both alleles are expressed. Like if you have an allele in an animal for red hair and an allele for white hair, you have an animal where some of the hairs are red and some of the hairs are white, like a roan in a horse or a German short hair pointer. All right, and there can also be more than two possible alleles. It's rarely as simple as there's only two possible outcomes, right? Think about just in humans, hair color, eye color, skin color. There's an incredible amount of variation. All right, so multiple alleles is when a gene has two or more alleles. And a good example of this are the human ABO blood groups. So what's your blood type? The alleles are uh, type A, type B, or zero is like none. Zero types. You can have codominant AB blood type as well. So these are the three alleles for ABO blood group. You can have A, B, or none. And it impacts our, the appearance of our red blood cells. So people with type A blood have these carbohydrates on the surface of their red blood cells. So a phenotype would be that they have type A blood. Type B blood has these other shaped carbohydrates on the surface of its blood cells. If you have AB blood, then you have both the type A carbohydrates and the type B carbohydrates on the surface of your blood cells. And if you have type O blood, you have no carbohydrates on the surface of your blood cells. So for your blood type, the phenotype of your blood type can come from these possible genotypes. So if you're type A blood, we can't tell just looking at your blood type if you're homozygous or heterozygous with type O. Same for type B. We can't tell if you're homozygous for type B blood or if you're heterozygous with one B allele and one type O allele. All right, so consider this. A man who's heterozygous with type A blood, so it would be one A allele and one type O allele, marries someone who's homozygous with type B blood. What possible blood types might their children have? Well, this homozygous type B blood person, she can only give this allele to her offspring, right? So make your punnet square. For this homozygous B person, there'd be one big B allele, big B allele. And the heterozygous parent would be a big A allele and a type O allele with this set lowercase i. You can carry those across, up and down, left and right, and put together your genotypes for possible offspring. And it doesn't matter which parent you put on top and which parent you put on the side. 
you'll end up with the same results either way. All right, good. So when you're all done, you should have, well, we have 50% of the offspring will have AB blood types, right? And 50% of the blood, the, the blood types of the offspring will be type B with a heterozygous genotype. Good. All right. So blood transfusions, if you're ever in a, like a car accident or something and you need to have more blood to replace what you've lost, you might receive a transfusion in the hospital. Blood transfusions must match your blood type. Mixing of different types of blood causes the blood to clump, and those clumps of blood cells can cause death. An important thing to consider for transfusions is the Rh factor. So this is a protein found on the red blood cells. Rh positive has the Rh protein or the Rh factor. Rh negative has no protein. So in addition to matching the ABO blood group, we also have to match the RH factors. And that's where you end up with like AB positive or O minus blood types. So this is where you can match up the donor's blood type with the recipient's blood type. So someone with O negative blood can donate their blood to anyone because there's none of the AB types or the RH factors that can interfere and cause clotting in the donor's or the recipient's body. Whereas someone who has O negative blood themselves, they can only receive donations or transfusion from someone who's also O negative. All the other blood types, if added to a person who's O negative, would cause clumping and death. All right, and here's an interesting graph of a distribution of blood types across different gene pools. So we see uh, um, in England, the most common blood types are O and A. In Southeast Asia and Laos, O and B are the most common. In India, blood type B is the most common. In Zimbabwe, blood type O is most common. Among Native Americans, they're almost exclusively type O. There are no type B alleles. And among Australian Aborigines, they also have a high proportion of type O blood types. So there's a lot of genetic variation among humans. Good. All right, I'm going to let you work through these practice problems on your own. If you have questions, talk to me about it and we'll go through them together. All right, and we also, oh, another thing we haven't talked about yet is polygenic inheritance. It's also rare that genes are determined or phenotypes are determined by a single gene. So genes can have more than two alleles and many traits have more than one gene that contribute to the phenotype. And skin color is one. So the effect of two or more genes acting upon a single phenotypic character is called polygenic inheritance. And this is a great one. In humans, there are three different genes that contribute to skin color. So we can end up with 64 different possible genetic combinations here. So it's incredibly interesting, but this is why we see the huge variation and variety in skin tone that we do see. Skin color, by the way, does have um, some real evolutionary advantages. So traditionally, people, well, all humans evolved in Africa, right? And Africa's 
the parts of Africa where humans lived is closer to the equator. Um, having access to sunlight and vitamin D wasn't a limiting factor for their health and well-being. But um, getting damage uh, to skin cells by UV radiation was. So that's why it's beneficial if you come from a gene pool that comes from more equatorial regions. If you have darker skin, it contains more of the protein melanin. This pigment helps um, to prevent mutations from UV radiation. So it's, you'll be less likely to have skin cancer if you have a darker skin tone, your body produces more melanin. And then as humans migrated out of Africa into more northern latitudes where sun exposure became more limiting, the risk of skin cancer wasn't nearly as high. But um, having that much melanin in your skin can also limit your skin's ability to absorb sunlight and produce the vitamin D. Vitamin D we get from skin exposure to sunlight. So if your ancestors come from a gene pool that used to live farther from the equator, then you may have lighter colored skin so that your ancestors were able to take advantage of all the sunlight they could get to produce vitamin D. So there's benefits to having lighter color skin if you live someplace where sunlight is more scarce. And if your ancestors come from a place where sunlight and skin cancer are a bigger health risk, then having more melanin in your skin can be beneficial. But that's all the further the extent of the amount of melanin in your skin goes. It's not related to any other traits. All right, let's talk about nature and nurture. So both genetic and environmental factors can influence phenotype. These are hydrangea flowers. They vary in shade and intensity of color depending on the acidity and aluminum content of the soil. So these two plants could be genetically identical, but in different environments, they'll produce different colored flowers. All right, one way that we track inheritance patterns is by using pedigrees. And a pedigree is a diagram that shows the relationship between parents and offspring across two or more generations. The convention is to use circles for biologically female relatives and squares for biological males. If the trait that you're studying is expressed, then those shapes would be filled in solid. If it is not expressed, then they'd be left empty. So here's a pedigree analysis for the widow's peak trait. Widow's peak is where you get this little point in your hairline on your forehead. Some people have it, some people don't. Um, but if we were to follow this, so uh, say these two sisters want to know where their widow's peak alleles come from, they could create a pedigree of their family and trace the allele back through time to see how this sister ended up with it, but this sister didn't. So these two siblings have the same parents because they're full siblings. Both parents have the widow's peak. On the dad's side, we see dad's one of four siblings. He has one sister who also has a widow's peak and two without. And if he looks at his parents, we'll see his dad has the widow's peak trait, but mom doesn't. So you can see how those alleles shook out throughout that family pedigree. If we look on the mom's side, mom also has a widow's peak. Um, she has one sibling who doesn't, and if she looks at both of her parents, dad doesn't have a widow's peak, but her mom does. So the question down here is, is having a widow's peak a dominant or a recessive trait? Good. The way to tell is to look at the heterozygotes. 
right? So these individuals who are heterozygous, if they have the phenotype of having a widow's peak, then they must, widow's peak must be a dominant trait. All right, uh, here's another way to do a pedigree analysis on PTC tasting. There's this chemical PTC. Some people, it tastes really better. Some people can't taste it at all. You could do the same thing to give this PTC paper to everyone in your family, have them taste it and see how it shakes out. It's just another way of watching a trait move through your family tree. All right, let's look at this one together. So the pedigree below traces the inheritance of alkaptonuria, a biochemical disorder. Affected individuals are shaded. Does alkaptonuria appear to be caused by a dominant or a recessive allele? So we don't have any genotypes to work with here, right? You know, this individual is, doesn't display the phenotype but this one does. And of their offspring, we see two out of four also have the condition, but two out of four don't. So it's 50-50. If we look over here, so Sandra married into the family because her family tree isn't included up here. Sandra doesn't have the condition, but Tom does. However, neither of their offspring do, and their grandchild doesn't. So this might be some evidence that if, if this were a dominant trait, Tom may have given one to Daniel or Alan, right? One of his alleles, and they would be expressing the trait um, or Tom is Tom could also be a heterozygote right and he just happened to pass on his recessive allele with Sandra to Daniel Allen so if oh, there's my cursor all right, so if Tom was a heterozygote, it could be that he just happened to pass a recessive allele on to Daniel and Alan. If the condition were recessive, then Tom would have to have two recessive alleles, right? And these two would have to be heterozygotes. If it were recessive, they would both have a normal phenotype. And it's possible Christopher could be a carrier too. So we can't tell yet looking at this. Let's look over here at this pairing. So Anne doesn't have the disorder. She and Michael have Carla. Carla does have the disorder, which means that Carla had to get the alcaptonuria allele from someone. She had to have gotten it from Anne. So Anne must have been a carrier. So if Anne was a heterozygote and it was dominant, then Anne would be shaded in, but she's not. So Anne must be heterozygous and the condition is recessive. Michael must also be a carrier, a heterozygote. So we can tell looking at this part of the pedigree that it must be a recessive allele and that Anne and Michael must both be carriers or heterozygotes. All right, so let's compare and contrast some genetic disorders. Autosomal recessive disorders. So that means autosomal means that it, it occurs on a chromosome that's not an X or a Y chromosome. And if it's recessive, you need to have two copies of the allele to express the genetic disorder or condition. Albinism, cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs, sickle cell disease, and phenylketonuria are all autosomal recessive conditions. They're on the regular autosomal chromosomes, 
and you have to have two recessive copies in order to express the genetic condition. Autosomal dominant are genetic conditions that are coded for on the chromosomes, all the chromosomes other than X or Y, but you only need one copy of the allele to express the genetic condition. And this includes achondroplasia, which is a type of dwarfism, and Huntington's disease. All right, multifactorial disorders. So there are also a lot of health conditions that have a genetic component, but there also are environmental factors that play into this. There would be things like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, alcoholism, and a lot of mental illnesses also are multifactorial diseases, disorders. So if any of these kinds of things run in your family, um, it would be wise to meet with a genetic counselor um, so that you understand how these, dis, uh, these genetic conditions could impact your future family um, so that you can be prepared to meet those needs and understand what the probability is that um, you might have a baby with those conditions. All right, I'd like you to work through these practice problems. If you have any questions, please let me know. Let's talk about epigenetics here and then we'll wrap this up. So epigenetics is the study of how environmental and behavioral factors affect how your genes are expressed. And these changes are sometimes reversible, unlike mutation, right? So for example, smokers versus non-smokers versus former smokers. So we know that smoking can result in epigenetic changes. For example, it's certain parts of the AHRR gene, which regulates cell growth and division. Smokers tend to have less DNA methylation, which turns the genes off. The difference is greater for heavy smokers and long-term smokers. However, after quitting smoking, Former smokers can begin to have increased DNA methylation at this gene. Eventually, they can reach levels similar to those of non-smokers. And in some cases, this can happen in less than a year, but the length of time depends on how long and how much someone smoked before quitting. But basically, what this research is showing us is that smoking can actually inhibit your body's ability to control and regulate cell growth and division. Now, uncontrolled cell growth and division sounds a lot like cancer, doesn't it? That's what it is. So this is how smoking increases cancer risk. The good news is that within about a year of quitting smoking, that risk goes away. Your body is able to heal and those epigenetic effects are no longer impacting the ability of your body to express this AHRR gene and regulate cell growth and cell division, which is pretty cool. All right, so these next couple slides are summary slides. You should understand complete dominance and incomplete dominance, codominance, multiple alleles. We didn't really talk about pleiotropy, but pleiotropy is when one gene affects multiple phenotypic factors. Sickle cell disease is one of these. If you're homozygous recessive for sickle cell disease, then you have sickle, sickle cell disease. If you are heterozygous, then uh, you are you have enhanced immunity to malaria, which is a really big health benefit. All right, epistasis is the phenotypic expression of one gene that impacts the expression of another. And polygenic inheritance. You'll also need to know about epigenetics. All right, so now you should be able to define terms common to basic genetics. You should be able to explain monohybrid and dihybrid crosses using Punnett squares. You should be able to explain the common cases of inheritance beyond Mendelian genetics. 
So these would be things like incomplete dominance, co-dominance, and so forth. You should also be able to describe epigenetic effects on gene expression. So how behavior and environment impacts how your genes are expressed without actually changing the genetic code. All right, as always, any questions you have, write them down, bring them to student office hours or class so we can chat about them together or chat with your, with your classmates. All right, thank you for watching.